All right, we're back here with Dan Corn again. He's been telling us some interesting stories. Um, we covered Braxton Bragg a while ago. What about um, Rosecrans? We don't hear a lot about him. What can you tell us? Tell us something we don't know. William Stark Rosecrans was a very smart man. Uh, he was an inventor. Uh, he had developed a system of working with kerosene. Uh, for lamps and, and things uh, like that, and uh, he unfortunately for himself was uh, seriously injured before the war uh, by an explosion uh, in his uh, laboratory, uh, his place of business, which left his face scarred, and was, that's one of the reasons why he grew the beard that he did, uh, was to cover up the, the scars so that people wouldn't see, the, see him on his face. Huh. Uh, he was a convert to the Roman Catholic faith. Uh, he first got involved with that at West Point, and, and he became extremely uh, religious in his views. He loved to argue theology with others. Uh, in fact, his, uh, oh. his brother uh, uh, also became a member of the Catholic faith and eventually became a priest and eventually uh, became the first bishop of the city of Cincinnati, Ohio. So he had a, a, a strong uh, religious streak to him, which in some ways drove some of his staff crazy because, like I said, he loved to argue theology with them, and most of them, of course, were Protestant in their views. So it, it, that right there made the man a, a rather interesting character. The other thing about the poor guy, which I always felt was something that really got in the way, was that he stuttered. Oh, okay. The more tired he got... Or the more nervous he got, the more pronounced the stutter became to the extent that he will almost literally quack like a duck and you could not understand him. Really? Qu yeah. Quack? Uh huh. Yeah, I can see what I'm doing. So, his voice would just get so uh, excited and everything. And um, that becomes a problem at Chickamauga. That is a problem at Chickamauga. Now, uh uh, he was one of the better students in his class at West Point. Like so many of them, he served out his time, did what he had to do with the military, and then went into private life. And, of course, as, as I said, became an, uh, was an inventor and a businessman, was called back into the Army or, you know, volunteer. What did he invent? Man. I'm pardon? What did he invent? Well, he, he, he invented a use specifically for kerosene. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. And stuff like okay, that. Yeah. Yeah. And refining the kerosene, it's uh, refining the, the kerosene in a better way in order to be able to use it. But in one of his, uh, you know, when they were working on one of his experiments to, to, to make a better product, uh, it exploded. Okay. And his hands and his face were both burned uh, pretty well. He had some pretty, pretty significant scars on his face, which, as I said, the beard covered up most of it. Uh, not all of it, but enough of it. Uh, so that he was done. Old Rosie was his nickname. Uh, his soldiers really liked him. Unlike Braxton Bragg, William Stark Rosecrans was very much liked by the common soldier. Old Rosie. Very much liked. Uh, he, uh, he often walked through the camp at night just to kind of check on the morale of his men. That's not something Bragg ever did. And if he saw a light on in a tent after, after hours, after, you know, taps and everything, a lot of times he would rap on the wall of the tent uh, and when the soldier came out, or soldiers came out to see who the heck was bothering them, he'd be standing there smiling at them, and they'd chuckle and salute him and say, okay, good night, sir, and go back to bed. They called him Old Rosie. That's not good for really discipline, though, is it? No, but he did not have a lot of discipline issues in his army. Uh, uh, he, uh, for some reason, uh, unlike Bragg, who was a martinet and he had tons of discipline issues, Rosecrans did not. Uh, he was uh, he was a good trainer. Uh, he was a very good manager as, in terms of making sure that his troops were properly supplied, properly fed, uh, all these different things taken care of. And he had good, strong, subordinate officers. George Thomas, uh, you know, being, the, being the, at the top of the Thomas, in fact, had turned down command of that army. Uh uh, uh, just not wanting to take it. Uh, he, he felt that you know some people would resent him being in a, that position because he was a Virginian, as opposed to Rosecrans, who was, if I remember correctly, was from Ohio. 
So and you know a lot of that army uh, was made up of boys from the from the west and Ohio was and Indiana and all that was the west back then. So uh, his command was was good. Uh, they liked him. They respected him, and they were willing to follow him. So when uh, good the, commander the, or I'm sorry, good good commander or good good circumstances. I mean, was, well, he was, was he a good, good commander. Okay, he was a uh, good commander. Uh, he had the you know uh, uh, the unfortunate things that happened with him later on at, at uh, Chickamauga was it was it was, was there was a combination of different things that occurred that created that particular situation that took place uh, there. Some of it was his fault. Some of it was not his fault. And uh, that's just uh, the way things work sometimes. It seems like with a lot of those battles, it's just uh, sometimes just pure luck that a few minutes well, here, a few minutes there, that could win all the difference. When you, when you look at how these things were, uh, in particular, at Stones River, both armies had planned to do the exact same thing to each other. Yeah. They're both going to attack on you know, the left, so to speak. Almost yeah. like a circle, and it's it's by sheer coincidence, sheer luck, that Sh Sheridan, uh, who was uh, one of his division commanders, found out that the uh, Confederate troops were moving in force in in front of his lines. Uh, heard them very early in the morning, went out and checked it, and realized that there was a movement going on, and started to mass troops. It could have been a very different story that day. If if uh, certain if Sheridan hadn't realized what was going on, and kind of uh, blew off his 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 particular senior commander, who kind of told him, "Don't worry about it." And he said, "No, I'm going to worry about it." And went out there and got got men lined up, uh, ready to fight and be prepared. Willick and Hayes and all those guys that were out there. So, uh, in that sense, Rosecrans was considered to be somewhat of a lucky guy in that sense. Uh, but that was a that was a bad bad fight uh, at Stones River. Uh, Grant did not like him. He and Grant did not get along for some reason or another. I think Grant saw him as a rival okay. and did not trust him and uh, was not necessarily looking to get rid of him, uh, but he, 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 did not want, uh, he did not want to work with him any more than he had to. Uh, again, I think it was you know, the Ohio boys there, a rivalry. And, uh, you know, Rosecrans had been yeah. successful in civilian life. Grant had not been successful in the civilian life. So there was that. Grant was a, uh, you know, of, of the, a Protestant uh, persuasion. Rosecrans was a devout uh, Catholic convert. So there may have been something there as well. Uh, that, uh, How old of a man was he when this war started, Rosecrans? They were, all in their, they were all in their late 30s, early 40s. Okay. Uh, Mexican War Service? Um. Um, in Rosecrans' case, uh, no. Okay. I couldn't recall off the top of my head no. if he was... No. He just... But he was a, no, he was a natural born leader. He, uh, he, had, good, he, had, he had good instincts. Um, he just... Um, he had a bad streak at, at Chickamauga. Yeah, like I what said, the the, the Fortress Rosecrans, Fortress Rosecrans, which is what he built at Murfreesboro, post uh, Stones River, was a huge fort, uh, extremely well manned and stocked. And the Confederates weren't even going to try and touch that. And then, of course, he goes after Bragg in, in the Tullahoma campaign. Uh, and he comes through all those mountain passes and everything. And Bragg's got no idea where he's going to pop up. And so they come through and, and just uh, scares Bragg out, out of his wits. Of course, he, he had a particular weapon or uh, thing that he was working with with him that was good, which was Wilder's Brigade. And Wilder's Brigade was a very interesting uh, group. This was, uh, John Wilder was a cavalry, was a converted cavalry officer, but his men all carried Spencer repeating rifles. Oh, and, wow. Okay. And this was something new at this point in the war. Uh, Wilder had wanted to outfit his men with this particular weapon and had been turned down. And so what he did was he went to the bank, the bank, uh, his local bank from his hometown, got them to approve a loan for him 
to buy the weapons for his men, and the men paid them back out of their pay so much per pay period for the weapons. Oh. Well, when Seward found this out, it so embarrassed him, the fact that they had done this, that he he authorized uh, payment for the weapons from the from the uh, War Department in full to that particular bank, and the soldiers uh, got their money back, what, what money had been taken out of their pay already. But th this was the light, what was called the Lightning Brigade, and Rosecrans would send him off to do these raids or these attacks that um, and, 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 you know, they, they, they'd hit real fast, shoot real hard and fast, and then take off, and oh, Bragg just wow. didn't know where they coming from. I, uh, I didn't know this. Yeah. The Lightning Brigade, you said? Lightning Brigade. Mm -hmm. There's huh. a monument to them up in Chickamauga Battlefield now. The Lightning uh, Brigade. I mean, almost, I mean, I know that almost like a shock troop or. You know, very, yes, except they were on horseback. Like I said, they were armed with seven shot repeating uh, Spencer rifles. And uh, that, uh, that drove the Confederates crazy. So, and they were all, you know. And well, he utilized those, well okay. trained. John Wilder did a very good job of training his men, and they had a they had a kind of a devil may care uh, attitude to them. Uh, the, the, they were they were they were good soldiers, good soldiers. So Rosecrans, his best performance was the the campaign where he Bragg retreated yeah, out of Tennessee. It was a masterful campaign. Yeah, and fire, yeah or, between mm -hmm. Stones River and Chickamauga. I mean, he drove Bragg out of Chattanooga. Almost without firing a shot, practically. There are no yeah. true what we call pitched battles. Uh, Bragg pulls out because he's afraid of what's going. He's afraid he's going to get trapped there because uh, he doesn't know where Rosecrans is coming from, and he knows he's got superior forces to him. So that's, that's when he pulls out. That's when Jefferson Davis finally realizes he needs help, and uh, they they you know, he went to he went to Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee refused to go to the West. <laughs> So that there is, you know, I've read that in um, the, the other Shire book, of, uh, Last Full Measure. So that is true. Davis did go ask Lee to go yes. take command of the West. Okay. Lee, Lee did, uh, Davis did request of Lee that he would, if he, if he would consider going to, to the Western Theater and, and Lee demur demurred immediately and told him, no, you need to send somebody else. And that's yeah. why they decided. That's when they decided to detach Longstreet's corps, what was left of it, and and send them out out, out west for a while. I'll be fair, uh, Lee was from Virginia over the right, and, and Lee had blinders on. Lee had yeah. blinders on. He really did. He could not see the war as a whole the way Grant was able to. So, they sent Longstreet out there, and it helps. Or, or I mean, works momentarily. And what I mean, what happens, to Chickamauga? How did? How did well, those... what actually occurred was that first of all, Rosecrans had not slept in three days, at least three days. Oh God! Okay, and the man was incredibly tired. Uh, he was he, he was living on coffee, army coffee, and was not eating. And was you know just drinking coffee, not eating, not sleeping, and unlike Thomas, who kept falling asleep on a chair at that one meeting that they had, uh, he just was so worked up. He was very, very concerned about the spy, which was what he called. You know, they called Charles Dana, uh, sending back reports regarding how they were doing with the fight. And in the midst, what what occurred is that he inadvertently moves troops out of a sector without realizing that he has not replaced them. So there is this gap in the Union Army. And Longstreet hit that gap with all of his men, lined up in a, in a particular echelon-type fight. Uh, a lesson they learned at uh, from watching what happened at Gettysburg. And they, just, later, right? and they just, and he had Hood leading it. And if you know anything at all about Sam Hood <laughs> as a division uh, corps commander, that man was a was a warrior. I've always said God didn't make him any better than, no. than Hood. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As a combat commander, he was an excellent commander. 
Other than that, you know, I wouldn't give him anything else. And even Robert E. Lee acknowledged that fact. You know, no, don't you dare to, you know. You know, you know. <laughs> but uh, as a combat Austin commander. Bam, hammer. I mean, hit him with everything he had. Yes, he did. And he slammed into that hole and he split the Army, Union Army uh, basically into two pieces. That was not, it was Rosecrans' fault because he was the overall Army commander. But nobody else, the, 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 the commander that he forced to, to make the move had already been chewed out by him for something else that had occurred uh, the day before. And the guy was afraid to repeat the mistake of not listening. Even though he knew that the orders were not correct, he did not want, he did not want to risk being screamed at again because Rosecrans literally did that, screamed right at him. In so front of all Rosecrans takes off running and panic and with half the army and Thomas makes a stand. Is that well? He, well, he, he got caught up in the retreat as far as that was concerned. Uh, I mean, you know, Charles Dana is a standard yelling, We gotta get out of here, we gotta get out of here, we gotta get out of here. And Garfield is just looking at him, going, Yeah, we better get out of here. Um, that, but that, but not Thomas. Thomas was unflappable. <sighs> okay, so so half the army takes off and the other half. Hold on. Yeah. So, and in fact, some of that army that took off turned around and came back when they realized that Thomas was making a stand and holding on. Did Rosecrans come back? No. <laughs> oh my God. He did. The commander did not come back. No. Uh, oh God. Uh, how did that go over? Yeah, it didn't go over well at all, obviously. <laughs> Uh, but again, as I said, the man was, by that point, he was a mess. Um, he was a mess. Uh, he was extremely overtired, way overtired. You know, to people talk about, well, you know, the soldiers don't get enough rest. If your commanders don't get enough food and rest, then it doesn't make any difference what the rest of the army does. Because they're the ones in charge making the decisions. And he was too tired, in my opinion, uh, and not had enough rest. And now, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, food or anything, and he just simply was not capable of making a coherent decision. And others, when they realized he was making the mistake that he was, didn't have enough guts, whatever you want to call it, to call him on and say, "General, don't do this." So, so after he's, um, you know, relieving his command, what what happens to him? What's the rest of the story? He had minor, he had minor commands for the rest of the war. Just minor uh, stuff. Yeah. But he did he did have other field commands, though. Yeah. Uh, uh, like I said, uh, Grant did not want him uh, out there at all. He had him relieved. Uh, and, you know, I always felt kind of bad for him in so many ways because of the things that happened to him. But uh, uh, I'm just going to see if I got here. Exactly. What happened to him? Oh. All of this is in my uh, second book and everything like that. And just, and just uh, I keep I like to keep, I keep bringing it up. That name of that book is uh, what now? Tennessee Thunder. Tennessee Thunder is the second book. Just check. I'm just make sure. Uh, I want to make sure. Give me the right thing here, as far as that's concerned. Yeah, they just put him into uh, um, small field commands, and he was actually mustered out of the service in 1866. He became a a, uh, a U.S. envoy, a, a minister uh, overseas, and also the uh, uh, president of a railroad. Up under uh, Andrew Johnson, or when Grant took office, uh, uh, Johnson actually appointed him to, as an envoy. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And uh, then he, uh, then after Grant, he uh, when Grant came in, so he, that's when he went back into private uh, life and uh, railroads. Uh, he did okay for himself. He did all right. a lot. A lot of them were into uh, railroads. Um, that was the big thing. I mean, that was where the. Uh, 
uh, you know, the the country was moving west, and they were building all of this railroad. Then, you know, during the war is when they realized just how important an effective railroad system was, uh, yeah. and that was one of the reasons why the South lost the war because they didn't yes. have uh, the capabilities to build railroads that the North had. Not to mention, they never built the, the railroads the same way twice. Uh, yeah, I remember reading, um, you know, something about that right too. How they diff, uh, South had different, um, said build them twice. Um, well, part of the reason why when Grant, when when Longstreet's forces were moved from Virginia to Georgia, that it took so long was because the railroads could not be connected together, because the the gauge of the track, which is the width, was different. So they had to literally get the men off the trains at the end of one line and move all of the men and their supplies and equipment and you know artillery and everything onto a different train on this other line. And this did, happened several times in the course of that trip. Did Lee, I go back to touch, back to touch on this, uh, turn down command, was he okay with Longstreet's Corps being taken? Uh, uh, he, well, at that point, at that time, there was a rift between the two men uh, having to deal with what, what had happened at Gettysburg. And they, they weren't exactly, I will not say that they were angry with each other, but they weren't necessarily seeing eye to eye at that point. Longstreet and Lee? Yes. Okay, yeah, I can they, see that. They, they had detached, they attached Pickett's troops at that point were detached and sent down to Suffolk area around the, uh, what is today, uh, Norfolk, that neck of the woods. And Longstreet had kept his other two uh, divisions, and those were the ones that went with him out out west. Uh, and I think he also saw this. I mean, he. I'm not going to say that Longstreet actively. Uh, <laughs> I think it's okay. Well, I think Longstreet saw, was sort of uh, an opportunity. This change, but I I know he saw an opportunity to get out from underneath uh, leaf at least for a while and see what he could do with a different commander. And eventually, I mean, he did have command of a, of a force uh, besieging Knoxville, trying to get bro, uh, get Burnside. And I've always uh, said that. And, he, and, and I, he was not successful. I don't think I've, uh, I've made this statement before, and I don't think it's unfair or it's untrue either. Uh, Longstreet, to me, is an opportunist. I mean, when he sees an opportunity, he took it. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, on his behalf, but I mean, that's, that's how I've always viewed him. So yeah, I can see him taking that uh, or wanting to get it out from under Lee. Yeah. Well, it, you know, and, and he, was a a very, he was a very capable commander, but uh, uh, he, he core commander was probably about his top level as far as his ability to command, uh, actually command forces and stuff like that. Uh, his, his time as an army commander, I mean, was, was very brief and he just did do a very good job, uh, you know, knocking Burnside, you know, uh, uh, out of Knoxville. He, he was unable to do it. He what was, was Rosecrans total time as army commander? I'm sorry. Rosecrans. Uh, what, what years was his, to, what he, was his total time commander? Command the of, uh, the army of, uh, the Cumberland, which, uh, he took control of in the late fall of 1862 and was in command in charge of them until about November of 1863. Well, okay, Grant, so he had a good bit of time up under his four years yeah. relief. Um, that's been a... Who's the job about a year? Uh, I mean, it's, that's been it's, I mean, great biographical info there. I mean, it's a commander that I really know not much about, um, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, it's been a interesting um, segment. Uh, we're gonna have to um, if we come back and I've got one. We come back. The next commander I want to do. Um, uh, you, uh, as far as the Western campaign goes, um, that I think everybody will enjoy. Um, you're down to continue this series. Um, we'll bring you back on. How, how's that sound? Sure. <laughs>